Okay, uh, this is Greg Byrne, the Director of Athletics at the University of Alabama and uh, past president of NACTA as of about a, a week ago and uh, wanted to uh, welcome everybody here today and tell you how pleased we are that we get to talk about uh, the important subject that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's, we have NACTA members both on, on uh, the Zoom meeting today and also uh, we, I think we had over 1800 people register which is going to everybody shows up not everybody will get in so hopefully a lot of people watch in the future on NACTA's YouTube channel as well. I um, want to give you a, a little uh, information here. We're going to ha uh, have the discussion here in just a second. Maria Taylor is going to uh, uh, moderate the session. And then towards the end, we're going to have an opportunity for a brief Q&A portion uh, where individuals uh, participating will be able to answer your questions. And I'll come back on the screen to help uh, moderate those questions and answers. So when you have those, if you want to just start filling those in on the timeline or on the question and answer tab, that would be great. I want to give you a little background on how this all came together. Uh, first, about a year ago, uh, Mark Hollis and I, the former athletic director of Michigan State, had a session at the Spring Symposium at, at the Naval Academy, and uh, and Mark was able to talk about uh, everything that happened, uh, the, the very challenging things that happened at Michigan State, and uh, the feedback from the audience of that was was really uh, incredible, uh, and and both as an act of board and executive committee, we decided we needed to try to offer more opportunities to have really in-depth conversations about subjects that uh, need to be talked about. And so uh, about a few weeks ago, uh, we were having an act uh, executive uh, meeting or the executive members of our board. And we talked about the, the, obviously the murder of George Floyd, the different issues that were going on in our country. And uh, when, when we started talking about those, Bubba Cunningham, the athletic director at the University of North Carolina, jumped in and said to uh, Lee Reed, uh, who was the past president before me at Georgetown, and Ward Manuel, the AD at Michigan, and now president of NACTA, tell us about some of your experiences as an African-American man in our country. And what was supposed to be about a half hour call uh, ended up being, I, I think, darn well near an hour and a half. And the, the conversation we had, the ability we had to learn and try to understand. And I think sometimes we're all guilty of saying, man, I understand. Until you walk in somebody else's shoes, I don't know if we really can say that. And I, and I need to do a better job of that myself. And so uh, the conversation was so powerful that we talked amongst ourselves and, and said, you know, it'd be great if we had a panel that we could ha have a discussion that the NACTA membership could have access to. And so Today, we are absolutely thrilled that we get to welcome our panel, uh, Alan Green, the athletic director at Auburn. And even though he's at Auburn and I'm at Alabama, Alan's a, a dear friend of mine and a wonder, wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, we also have Ward Manuel, the athletic director at Michigan. Uh, Ward and I have been friends for, for a couple decades and just as equally a wonderful person and, and a great athletic director, athletic director and administrator. Uh, we've got China Jude, who's a senior associate AD and senior women's administrator at the University of Wyoming. She's also president of MOA this year, and we'll have a wonderful perspective to offer for us to learn and to grow with. And then uh, Maria Taylor from ESPN jumped at this opportunity when we reached out to her to talk to her about being involved in this program. And for those of you who uh, I'm sure everybody knows who Maria is on this call, but she's, she's one of the great broadcasters and reporters uh, in our in our country today, of any field, sports, news, anything, but for those of you who've got no, who have had the opportunity to know Maria, she's a better person, and uh, we really appreciate her taking the time to be on on this today. So, um, I look forward to listening and learning and growing, and look forward to the discussion. And we'll do the Q and A here at the end. So don't forget to put in your question and answers. But uh, thank you everybody for taking the time to be here, and I'll turn it over to Maria now. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Greg. First of all, I appreciate um, you extending the opportunity to even be a part of this conversation because it means a lot to me. Um, and for Katie Newman for doing such a great job of organizing and making sure that we're all on this, the right page or the same page, that was awesome too. Um, one of the reasons why it was important to me to be a part of this discussion um, with Alan and Ward in China is because when I was coming up at the University of Georgia, I had amazing athletic directors, I had an amazing athletic department, and 
You know, I looked up to Carlo Williams. I looked up to Damon Evans and they pushed me forward and have always kind of been in my corner, making me believe I could do anything. And so I value what each and every one of you guys on this panel does. And now I think one of the most important things that we can do is share some of those same experiences that Greg mentioned, but then also talking about solutions and ways to continue to move forward um, and turn what we're experiencing right now, not just as a moment, but as a movement that can make its way throughout college athletics. Um, so China, honestly, I would love to start with you and hear what the last few weeks, the emotions, the feelings, the experiences it's reminded you of um, that you've been feeling, I guess, as we all kind of process going through what I feel like is a little bit of a racial reconciliation. Well, thanks for asking and hello everyone. And it's such an honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, Maria, thank you very much for, for moderating this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to at least uh, let everyone know about MOA. I think that that's very important, me serving as the president for the next two years. Uh, the Minority Opportunities Athletics Association provides opportunities to exchange ideas, uh, increase participation and administrative opportunities for minorities in athletics. We're about 800 members strong, representing all the NCAA divisions, NAIA, junior college, and sports-related organizations. I'm so proud of this organization, and, and it's such an honor to serve as the president over these next two years, because this is a, a very important organization to have during these particular times. Now, to answer your question, I mean, being in Wyoming, a very conservative state, uh, there, there's a lot of emotion. So I want to make sure that I'm being very thoughtful in my thoughts, uh, what's happening, especially as we are getting our student athletes to be uh, involved and engaged uh, in, in this entire process. At times we put so many things uh, in front of what is happening in real life. Uh, there are many distractions to avoid talking about race. And so from COVID-19 where death rates among Black and African Americans and Hispanic and Latino persons were substantially higher than of white Americans to the criminal justice system where the days of the old Andy Griffin peace officer persona changed from protecting and serving now to uh, people being that's working in law enforcement being trained in a militaristic way thanks to the 1997 National Defense Authorization Act. Um, which leads to parents like me of a, a black young man to speak not about the birds and the bees, but to speak more about active shooting and how to handle yourself when law enforcement pulls you over. That's, that's a dramatic shift. Um, we shouldn't take a NIMBY approach. NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. Uh, it is everyone's issue of what is happening right now, and uh, which actually affects, of course, black and brown people. And we need to start talking about it and um, getting everyone engaged. It doesn't matter you know, what walk of life that we're in, everyone should be engaged and everyone should be a part of finding some solutions. So my take is, let's go from protest to policy. Let's start looking at those policies and seeing how we can make a difference. So I'm trying to really um, think of my former law enforcement days where I worked for uh, the sheriff uh, in another state and trying to make sure that we have um, some intentional and active engagement with all of our athletic stakeholders. Alan Ward, I'd love to hear from you guys too. And we can start with you, Alan, what the last few weeks of this last month has been like, what have you been processing through? Yeah, thank you, Maria. And Ch China's comments, I echo 100% from the beginning of being thankful and blessed to have the opportunity to, to engage with uh, my colleagues and the, the membership out there um, and be able just to kind of shed some light so let me, let me take a little bit of a different approach than the way China articulated it. Um, and I'll share with you kind of my personal, um, I won't say struggles, but um, just my personal perspective, right? And as a black man and as a leader of an athletics department, um, the, the most visible 
entity on campus and uh, at a university that is literally right down the street from uh, the civil, the beginning of the civil rights movement as, as we know it. And so it was, I struggled an awful lot trying to figure out how to balance my blackness and my leadership. And I've shared this candidly with, with our entire staff and trying to just determine, okay, am I speaking as Alan Green, the black man? Am I speaking as Alan Green, the AD? And what type of reactions are we going to get by whatever I say? So trying to find and, and I guess walk that tightrope, we use the term here, thread the needle an awful lot. So how are you gonna thread that needle of trying to articulate what our student athletes and coaches and staff uh, and me personally, what are we thinking and what's gonna come out of whatever it is that we say? Certainly we know that we're in, in a time uh, where everyone has a voice and so many people can hide behind Twitter handles and social media. Um, but I felt that it was a time to be really, really authentic. And after having conversations, and I've shared this with some other folks, but after having conversations with our head coaches about a week after Mr. Floyd uh, was murdered, it, it, it created an opportunity for us to have really uncomfortable but critical conversations. As humans, as people, remove, you know, throw titles out the window but then also as coaches, as a leader. And the thing I will say that I'm most proud of with our coaches and members of our athletics department and university is the overwhelming support and encouragement. And what I have learned is that whether you're white or whether you're black, each of us needs encouragement or anywhere in between. Like we all need encouragement to step out there. And I felt that I've had the full support of my coaches um, in our, in our de in entire department and university to speak about the reality of being black in America and to, to use this platform as, uh, as a way to share perspective in a very responsible manner. That isn't trying to detract from the message, but just be real and just say, here's how it is. And as I've, you know, three weeks gone by, so to speak, um, I, I feel like I've settled in as more of a leader, less of a black man, more as a leader. I uh, have gone through that emotional roller coaster of anger, frustration, confusion, um, doubt, hope. And now it's about, like China said, is finding ways to make sure that we can have a positive influence moving forward and to do so, most importantly, to do so in a sustained effort. Ward? Uh, those are both, both great uh, comments. Uh, and Maria, thank you for, for doing this for us. Um, quite frankly, I, I, just, I just started at being pissed off. Um, mad that, again, in our society, we have to deal with it. Um, but explaining to people who we're interested in understanding that this is sadly the norm in our communities. And so the outrage that people saw was just a buildup of all the years and decades and centuries of dealing with that type of abuse as a black person, a black man in particular, a black woman. And so the sad part about it is that it, it went unrecognized, meaning pe people didn't understand why people were so angry and frustrated and, and, and only focused on what people were doing in the way that they were protesting and some who got took it to another level. But that's inside, that type of anger lives inside when we see that. That type of frustration that wants to strike out against it again, happening. And so yeah, it, all those emotions were there, 
But for me, it starts and in, in ends at being pissed off that, I, that, A, we're still dealing with it. B, two weeks later, we have to watch another black man get killed over nonsense. And people say, how does it make you feel? Many people in this call may not know, I was working on a PhD in social work and psychology. I am very attuned to my own personal feelings and the feelings of others. And I am pretty, those who know me on this know I am straight forward in how I feel. And like Alan, I have to step back. And I was on a call with 60 of our student athletes, about 30 of our staff and some uh, allies. Listening to the pain as 18 to 22 year old student athletes had to try to understand how this continues to happen. And I had to explain that it didn't just start when they were born, that I had to deal with racism in New Orleans growing up. I had to deal with racism in, in Ann Arbor when I was here as a student and being uh, accused and, and pulled over because I fit, me and three other African-American student athletes fit the description at seven, eight o'clock at night coming home from, from practice and eating of people who were accused of stealing. So we had to get out of our car, guns drawn, down on our knees, handcuffed, frisked, questioned, all because we fit the description. And to see it 32 years later, it ain't changed. But I have to, we have to lead. And Maria, I heard some of the words that you said on this subject and they were powerful. And we have to keep leading because we have young men whose lives and women, black lives that do matter. They're not just athletes. They are not just athletes to me and to anybody on this panel and to most, most everybody listening. Maybe to the world, maybe to our fans, but not to me. They are young people who are dealing with this emotions behind it and having to deal with the physical and the mental and the looks that people give you when you're walking down the street as a black man with a hoodie on. Don't matter how educated you are. It doesn't matter that you're the athletic director at Michigan. You have a black hood on and a, and a, and a, a cap and some jeans and you get looks and stares and people hitting the locks on their door because you're approaching them. Come on, man, this, this, this should not be this way. But we're here to help. We're here to talk about it. We're here, to, I, want, I want to help. I want to be a part of the solution and I want to be a part of the, to the, this, the discussion, but you have to understand what I told Greg and I told the group, I said, you're talking about this as if, we're talking about it as if we're worried about other black men. When I get pulled over by the cops, I get scared. They don't know who I am. I do what my dad told me. I put my hands on the wheels and I don't move until they get right to the window. And they tell me to roll it down, I roll it down. They tell me that they need my ID, I reach in my pocket. But I don't start until they're right there and can see what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's those kind of things that you're just trying to teach people. People want to learn, they want to hear it, that's great. I'm going to tell them my experiences because I have a 22-year-old son. But I have 18 to 22-year-old uh, student athletes and I have 
hundreds of black friends that live this all the time. And, and former teammates and former athletes into the thousands that, that this, is, this is what we live. So I'm sharing that with everybody on this call because I shared it with the group so that they understood. This is not just a young black man's issue. This is a black man's issue. This is a black woman's issue of the things we deal with as it relates and how we feel about it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. And Ward, I, first of all, eloquently said and perfect and everything that we all needed to hear um, in this moment. But something that I really took away from that is a lot of people have been able to distance themselves from racism or the issues that we experience on a daily basis where, you know, I grew up in the state of Georgia. Like my grandmother couldn't go to the University of Georgia. Like she cried when I graduated because she didn't even think that she would see it happen. Like that's how close we are to certain situations right. and we forget about it. I've been on campuses and talked to football players and like, oh yeah, when we go to that town, they always call us the N word or whatever. And so we have a lot of people that are like, well, we just want to talk about sports. We don't want to hear about this anymore. It's like, but that black athlete, that young black man cannot escape his blackness, even when he's between, you know, anybody's lines on a field or on a court, it doesn't change for him. And for the first time, I think people are starting to recognize that that is also true, not only for that athlete, but for individuals like you, China, you know, Alan and Ward. But you guys also have the tremendous responsibility of not giving up on the next generation, but holding their hand and walking them through what they're seeing right now in your student athletes. So I'm just curious, how do you even begin to go about it? Because I know that I like went through huge despair, like a lot of younger kids have reached out and at first I didn't know what to say. And like you said, you realize, okay, I have to be a leader in this moment, but what does that mean to you guys? China, we can start with you. Yeah, you know, the, the thing is that the athletic identity can be so strong. And what happens is that we position our student athletes in this way that it's, it's really about the number on the chest and the back. And then when there are times when we're encouraging our student athletes to show who, who they are, as opposed to what they do, sometimes that could be a little nerve wracking because uh, student athletes are praised by, by what they do on the court in the field. And so we need to start making um, opportunities to allow our student athletes to show who they are, whether they're musicians or poets or artists. I mean, there's so much hidden talent all across the board. So when that time comes to speak up on the civil unrest, social justice issues, or anything that's making them feel uncomfortable in regards to race or gender or whatever those pressing issues are, that they have already exposed who they are. And so we have to spend a little bit more time supporting the person, um, the student first, and then the athlete. And, the, and that could really make a significant difference. Um, I definitely wanna comment on what you said, Maria and, and War, because my heart just cried out. Those are, I don't know what it's like to be a black male. And it scares me. It scares me for my son. <laughs> it scares me. And I recall sending a text to him uh, in, in uh, May, letting him know what he needs to do if law enforcement pulls him over. I spent two years working in law enforcement more on the prevention side of it to make sure that I never have to worry about these students or these kids being thrown in jails. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time not only coaching youth, but also talking to deputy sheriffs and law enforcement officers to make sure that they see the person before you start seeing the criminal. And with all these things that's happening, we went from slavery to Jim Crow, to the war on drugs, to mass incarcerations, now to death, knees, knees on necks. It just seems like it's just this never ending path. So um, we need to really start working on humanity 
more than anything uh, and start talking to each other more and not worry about offending people or denying things that are happening or avoiding or our wonderful statements. I don't see color and all those other micro aggressions that, that drives me crazy. You see color, you're at a stoplight, you see three colors. So you see me too. And, and acknowledging those uncomfortabilities, vulnerabilities and, and lack of information to start opening those discussions. Alan? Yeah, I mean, China hit the nail on the head. And as she was talking, I was, I was making some notes and, and she covered the same things that I was gonna cover. So let me, let me offer, let me offer a little bit of a different approach. And so I'm gonna take a stab and say, we've got 500 people on this call. We've got some others who are watching on YouTube. Um, a majority of the folks on this call, okay, I'm gonna make that assumption. A majority of our student athletes across the board um, are going to be white with the most visible athletes being black in football and in basketball. And so I would say to our white colleagues is you have a responsibility to educate yourself. We all have a responsibility to educate ourselves. And we also have a responsibility to take what we learn and apply that to the young people who we serve. We are in these roles because of these 18 to 22 year olds, as Ward mentioned, and they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. The black athlete experiences something very different than other athletes who sit in the minority categories. And as I've wrestled with my own guilt, or if you will, of black lives mattering, not the movement, but the statement, you start to realize that being black in America, you have a much higher likelihood of being arrested and being killed. There is lots of other discrimination out there and I don't wanna diminish that, but I do wanna highlight the fact that as Ward said, doesn't matter that he's the AD at Michigan, doesn't matter that I'm the AD at Auburn. I told this to our staff also, as soon as I jump in my car and drive down the beach, which is three and a half hours away, a lot of people from Auburn head down, to, head down to the beach. I have to think about which direction we go. I have to make sure that we have gas in the car, snacks in the car, because I don't feel comfortable stopping off at a gas station. I've got my wife, my kids in the car, Lord knows what can happen. So while everyone else gets to kind of make their way on down to the beach, and that's just an example, right? You have to understand that that road, that, that, that same road that everybody travels, we all experience it differently because we're all seen differently. And Blacks in particular are seen differently. So how do we help our student athletes? And one, in my opinion, we've got to help ourselves, educate ourselves, understand a word that China used, microaggressions. We're going to have a town hall meeting tomorrow where we're going to talk about that. People need to learn. And then just absolutely understanding that you cannot sit there and be quiet when you see some shit happening that shouldn't be happening. White, black, whatever, you cannot be quiet. That, that time of, oh, I'm not quite sure what to say, or I'm not quite sure if I should jump in or maybe someone's gonna be upset, so what? So what? It's not that silence is violence per se, but it's the same silence that, that continues to perpetuate the situations that we're in. And regardless of your skin color, you cannot just sit by idly and let people have these conversations or share these stories or even jokes, which I will admit are actually kind of funny, but they contribute to, they contribute to the systemic racism in our country. And we have got to be examples for our student athletes because they look up to us. Maria, you said it yourself. You look up to the people in your administration. Our black student athletes look up to us as blacks. Our white student athletes may look up to us also or people who look like them. 
And so we have got to really understand that we have an opportunity and an obligation to provide holistic education for our young people, not just on the field, not just in the pool, not just on the court, not just in the classroom to help them, you know, become eligible, educate them on life. And that's a responsibility of the administration and that's the responsibility, the responsibility of our coaches. Alan, I think in, in China that those items were well said. I, I don't really have a lot to add other than, um, you know, action. I tell our student athletes, um, speak about how you feel, listen to others and how they feel, uh, and then take actions, not just symbolic actions, actions. Uh, it's a verb, it's a, it means trying to do things that are gonna change this for the future. You can't go back and change the past. We can, we can talk about how we feel about it, we can talk about the impact it's had on us, but we can't change the past. But we can have actions that move us forward, whatever those are. <clears throat> One is uh, voting, voter registration, getting, getting young people to understand. You want to change how the police interact in your cities, you just can't vote every four years. You've got to vote in local and state elections. That's how you change policing and policies. You've actually got to read about who is on the ballot and understand what their philosophies and what they're going to bring to the table. You have to participate, in other words. Lots of our ancestors lost their lives so that we had a right to participate. And we don't, we don't. Not at the level that we should uh, be doing. And so uh, I just talked to him about taking actions and Alan hit on it. We, we call it bystander training, right? You know, don't, don't just sit there and, and watch if somebody does something to somebody else. So there, there was a, uh, people asked me, you know, how can I help, you know? Uh, how can I do something? I'm, I'm just a, a white person, white man, white woman. And I say, when nobody blacks around and somebody says something inappropriate about a black person, stand up and speak up. And if they don't stop, stop being their friend. That's, that's a step. I don't even need to know about it. You don't even need to tell me that you left so-and-so's house and you'll never be their friend again. You tried to get them to stop, but they just wouldn't. Your actions when nobody else is around are gonna be more meaningful than what you tell me or other black people that you did. That's when it's gonna start to change. When people realize in their interpersonal interactions with each other when there ain't nobody else around, with your own family to change their perspective and to say it's not right every time. Not just once, not at a meeting, not at one family Thanksgiving, and then you ignore it. Oh, I'm not going to change Uncle Joe. But you may change your niece or nephew who's listening to Uncle Joe. You may impact the lives of somebody who's new to the family by not just listening to Uncle Joe. And so I, this, this is probably the last time I'm gonna have a, a long conversation about this because I'm to the point where I'm really tired of talking about it. And I just tell people, take action, do something. You don't like it? Do something. You can protest, but after you protest and do that symbolic stuff, go do some real stuff. Go help register to vote. Go help uh, bring people to the polling places. Don't matter who they vote for. I'm not asking people. I don't care if you're a DRR. It doesn't matter to me. Irrelevant. Help people learn about who candidates are on both sides. But do something. Go work. Go work and volunteer uh, in community centers and help kids. 
to grow and educate and learn. Teach them about education, teach them about sports, teach them about politics, teach them about voting in their history and do all the things that take action. What I'm afraid of is I'm not gonna forget a month from now. What I'm afraid of is the silence of the conversation is gonna help people think it's okay now, everything has been fixed. It ain't gonna be fixed in a month, it ain't gonna be fixed in a year, sadly not five or 10 and probably not my lifetime, folks. This is gonna be a silence that needs to be an everyday battle. Don't stop, don't stop pushing for what is right. Now, last thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna say on this point, because I think it's important. People say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand, I don't know. I, I can't imagine, I, I've never been black. Imagine that for eight minutes and 46 seconds, that cop had his knee on a white man or a white woman or any other color, that was a person who died. And if you can't imagine the outrage and that things need to be different because ultimately we are all one human race. And we shouldn't have to treat anybody differently because of the color of their skin, the gender, their choice in terms of, uh, of how they want to dress or be, whether they're gay or straight, we shouldn't have to walk in this world with such hatred. And find that in yourself. If people hated you for who you are, how would you feel? That's how we feel. That's how I feel. I, I want to say amen to that, Maria. I have amen. to say amen. Amen. I thought we were already clapping church, over here. Right. Amen to that. Uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to make sure that denial is such a powerful thing. And there is something that's called uh, I, I read a book on the state of denials by uh, Stanley Cohen. And he mentioned um, there's literal denial and there's a, a implicatory denial, which focuses on, well, why should I take the risk of standing up for a person of color or someone who has a disability or LGBTQ plus or whatever? Why, why would I do that? Let Title IX handle it. Let the diversity and inclusion officer handle it or let another black person handle it. That becomes a problem. Um, if we're going to be in this together, uh, helping each other, everyone do need to stand up. There are five steps you can take if for those who may be uncomfortable uh, starting a conversation. You know, the first one, acknowledging what's happening in this world. I've noticed there are protests. Uh, I've noticed uh, there's police uh, brutality issues out there. That's the first step. Second step is acknowledging your vulnerability, your uncomfortability, your lack of knowledge on this issue. Why do you say Black Lives Matter? Help me, which is the third step. Ask for education. I don't know. Help me understand. Uh, the fourth step is don't counteract by saying a statement to uh, diminish any conversations about this, meaning don't counteract by saying all lives matter, you know, or well, if George Floyd didn't have the, the counterfeit $20 bill, the cops wouldn't have been called in the first place. I mean, so it's all these excuses why it's happening because if you counter use these counteract sentences, the first three steps are thrown out the window. And then the fourth step is, I mean, the fifth step is just how can I support you 
What do we do next? Where do we go? It's okay to, no matter what your ethnicity is, starting the conversation by just acknowledging something is going on, it's a start. And then hopefully we can go from the protest to the policies as Ward was talking about voting and volunteering and helping. But to sit back and be afraid to speak because you don't want to uh, offend someone is not helpful. It's not helpful in, in many regards. It could be complicit and we have to be mindful of that. Start somewhere, anywhere, but at least you're making some type of action. Yeah, I've been um, in a lot of candid conversations. I feel like even here at ESPN with my company and you know some leaders at other corporations and like the idea that I'm living on right now is like reckless honesty, reckless intentionality. Like I don't really care at this point <laughs> what you might think. It's like, I'm just gonna be very honest with you. This is not okay. This is not tolerable anymore. We need to fix X, Y, and Z. And my expectation is that a plan will make itself available. Like it needs to manifest itself. I need to have something to hold everyone accountable with. And I'm curious because all of you guys work at PWIs, which is predominantly white institutions. And you have a fan base that is majority white as well. As you guys continue to, like you said, Ward, we can't allow there to be silence and we have to continue to have these conversations. How do you handle that? Knowing that not everyone is going to be interested in having the conversation nor tolerant of it existing in the first place and going to want things to go back to normal. And all of us, I think we're at this point now where it's like, I just watched a man lose his life on camera for like you said, eight minutes and 46 seconds. What I won't do is let anything go back to normal because this is not normal. It's just not, Alan. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. No, go ahead, Ward. You're gonna say something more profound than I would anyway. No, no, <laughs> listen. Uh, I, Maria, I echo those thoughts. I, I really could care less how people feel. Mm -hmm. I, I can care less that they don't wanna have the conversation and I can care less that they're uncomfortable or they're offended I, I walk around and I'm offended uh, quite a bit by comments and reactions and interactions uh, in the way that people react to uh, our student athletes when they make mistakes. As if the people out there in, in Twitter land hiding behind fake names and fake personalities and fake pictures or pictures of, of nonsense can decide how people really are. You care less. I'm gonna support our student athletes to, uh, to speak up and speak their minds, to uh, have uh, protests, or symbolic protests if they decide they want to take a knee. But also I'm going to support them and push them to take action and to do things that are important to change this. Taking a knee is not going to change. It's not going to impact anybody. But I, I'm not going to let the, the, the level of you disrespecting the flag, you, I'm not disrespecting the flag. You're, you're acknowledging that people are hurting while our national anthem that gives us and talks about and is, is played because we have the right to freedom of choice and freedom of how to express ourselves and, and what to do. And my father behind me in his army uniform served this nation for eight years. My, my father-in-law served this nation for 24 years in the Air Force. My brother-in-law fought in the first Iraq war. I understand deeply what our military and our country mean. And we have fought as black people alongside uh, soldiers, white soldiers, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, to protect this country. But those kids in those uniforms that hang, that go out on our field and play for our institutions 
are great young people who have a great understanding of how they feel and the expression that they want to, to make. And we need to make sure that they have that right to do that, even in the face of people feeling that all they should do is play. That ain't what they do. That's not who they are. That's not how we, they, they were raised and it's not how we gonna treat them. They are special people that deserve to be uh, listen to as people who are learning as students and who are performing as athletes and their lives matter, their words matter, their actions matter to all of us who care deeply about them. And I tell my staff all the time, our student athletes are more than what they do on the fields of play. Yes. And for those who are in this industry, in our, they, don't, they may not touch them every day. They may only market them every day. They may mm -hmm. fundraise every day. They don't get to see them as people. And I try to remind my staff every time I can get a chance that they are first and foremost young people. And we need to care about them there first and the rest will continue to spread out. Yeah, Ward, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to uh, get my thoughts here in, in a way where it can be beneficial for everybody. Um, I, I, I sent out a video uh, a few weeks ago and I was someone asked if I was af afraid to do the video. And I said, I wasn't afraid to do the video. I was afraid to hit send. Um, towards point, you don't know how people are going to respond. And some people don't want to hear it. And some people don't want to acknowledge the fact that we have a real issue of racism in our country. And I, the responses that I got from our fan base, from our donor base was overwhelmingly positive. And it, it, it helped me understand what's in people's hearts. And it helped me understand that there are lots of people who don't know how to have that conversation, never had the opportunity to have the conversation, or maybe friends with lots of Black people. But if you're Black, when was the last time you had this conversation about race and about your experiences with a white colleague? Probably never until, until now. And so I had a conversation with one of our donors, a very high level donor who we talked for 45 minutes and I kind of joked with him about some of the conversations I've been having and said, even the sensitivity of, you know, black African-American people of color and a new acronym that I learned is, um, oh crap, I forgot. Uh, anyway, whatever, something, something I learned. I'm like, oh, didn't know that one existed. <laughs> and so we laughed and I'm like, but we need to have that conversation because I may prefer black and someone else may prefer African-American and that's okay. But for those who truly want to keep their head in the sand and Ward said this, it's completely, it's worth reiterating. For those folks who don't think that our country is racist, not all people, but our country, I would say, Picture something that's happening in this world. And imagine that being your husband, your wife, your child. Imagine sending your child out into the world, not knowing if they're going to return. You think about that when, they, when you send the, when your children to war or your husband or your wife out to war. The Black community feels that same way. And to, to act like it doesn't exist tells me that you don't want it to exist. You, don't, you, you want to ignore it. And we have to acknowledge that you're not going to save everybody. And I've told, I've told our staff this, I've told my kids this. Your goal, and, I, and, I, and let, me, let me share this also. The conversations I've been having with my white colleagues, I sense guilt. Like I, I sense white guilt like I've never sensed before. And that's something that I did not know. I have learned that. 
And I also understand and appreciate that many of my white colleagues want to make such big difference. And sometimes I have to tell them, you don't have to make a big difference, but a whole bunch of us need to make little difference. And if we can change, not the world, but change the world for someone, as a white colleague shared that a story with me, change the world for someone. And if enough people do that, then we will change the world. I feel like that it, that reigns so true in that there are so many individuals that we come in contact with and everyone who's on the Zoom, so it's a part of NACTA, there, you can impact just one kid. Like you could change a generation with one individual, with one kid that goes on to do X, Y, Z. It doesn't have to be in sport. But at the same time, that takes a lot of energy and effort. And sometimes we, we start to think like, well, we got to do this. Our jobs are requiring us to do X, Y, and Z. And I think we're now in a moment where it's like, what is my purpose really going to be moving forward? Or what am I really going to be dedicating my time and interest into? I'm curious just in general, since most of our audience is in college athletics, because it's an issue that I've always struggled with, is just the lack of diversity in it in general. Like the numbers are astonishing to me. I've had coaches literally, and we have the same issues in broadcasting. They'll come up to me and be like, you literally can't leave college football because you have to hold the line for the next black girl. <laughs> they, if you leave, they might not hire another one. So you got to stay until there's one in the pipeline. How do we attack it? How do we change it? How do we work towards making sure that, you know, the diverse um, majority of the candidates that we actually, I know that they exist. I know the minorities that are talented, that they find a spot or an opportunity in our world in college athletics. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, is definitely, that is definitely a space that we've been talking a lot in MOA and, and pretty much tracking uh, black and brown uh, athletic directors and senior level administrators around the NCAA. Um, and, and definitely shout out to athletic directors who are making a significant impact in diversifying their senior staff. You know, that, that has to make a significant difference. So if you haven't had the, uh, around the nation who's listening to this, if you haven't had the opportunity to read Dr. Richard Labchek's uh, race and gender report card, because this, the numbers are in there. This happens. I just every, looked at it, China. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so you know, this happens every year, ladies and gentlemen, and people, and, and I'll, I'll probably, you know, shine a lot of the spotlight on uh, non-ethnic minorities like a Joe Castiglione at Oklahoma, like a B Ross Barak at Texas A&M, who hired a black woman as as uh, his deputy athletic director, and Nikki Moore at Colgate, who hired uh, an African American woman as his her deputy athletic director in SWA. When when athletic administrators are being intentional and making sure that their senior staff is diverse because that's gonna help navigate and, and supporting our student athletes, but it's also creating that pipeline, like Kevin White at Duke University, creating that pipeline to make sure that um, they are mentoring the next in line. That makes a significant difference. But Maria, the, the tough part about it is that at times when uh, I see athletic departments where they're in urban environments or in the areas where you, they have a large population of black and brown people, and I look on their senior staff and I said, okay, I don't even understand that. Mm -hmm. Like, how are they servicing student athletes? What I get frustrated with that is how many apologies I have to hear when someone says something out of pocket, offensive, uh, racial, and then they have to come back and apologize for that, it's apparent that people don't have people around them to be able to speak on uh, the appropriate talking points. So we need to make sure that a pipeline is created. There are a lot of people of color who are ready. Athletics, soon to be athletic directors, uh, we have to educate our university presidents and chancellors. Uh, we don't want to continue to put all these wonderful mission statements out and strategic plans out about diversity. And then we see the staff, whether it's on the president or chancellor's leadership team, as well as the athletic director's leadership team, and, and it's not matching. 
So there are a lot of people who are ready. I know that there's only a limited number of positions, but um, we need to be very intentional when it comes to recruitment. The retention, like you were speaking about Maria, just staying in there, retaining you to make sure to prepare for new uh, um, people in media, new women of color and, and people of color in the media, but also how to advance them. Mm -hmm. That makes a significant difference. And don't be nervous about hiring someone different because we have to have those different philosophies. I'm in Wyoming. <laughs> I'm in Wyoming, guys. <laughs> Think about this. I came from New York City as the director of athletics and moved to Wyoming because I have a great athletic director who is mentoring me for my next position, which at one day it will be an athletic director. So I, I hope that everyone who have the opportunity to look at your diversity plan and make sure that you are nurturing those younger administrators to be prepared for their next level. And for those athletic departments who do not have diversity, and I'm not talking about that one token uh, administrator, I'm talking about true diversity around, uh, reevaluate, please. That's really important. And if you need help, here's MOA to help you. <laughs> Sorry for the shameless plug, but I had to. No, as you should. <laughs> Maria, I've got I've got two things that may be helpful to the group, and I, I yeah. saw one of the questions on here was um, uh, how do you improve diversity without seeming like you're filling a quota? Um, mm -hmm. I would say your motivation to have a more diverse staff should not be filling a quota, but for putting talented people around you or around this team so that your team can be better, so that you can better serve, right? Um, don't do it just because, oh, we need to have a person of color or we need to have a female. No, the, the more diverse perspectives you have, the better decisions you are going to make, which is gonna prevent you from getting in trouble, which is gonna keep your job longer. So let that be a motivation for people who are out there who are trying to be curious about how to improve their diversity. The second thing I'll say is, and this is what we've done here, and I, I stole this from Kevin White. He has, um, and I bet you Mimi Hill is on the call, um, so shout out to my girl Mimi. One of the things that Kevin did was he created entry-level positions um, for, for people to be under his tutelage, if you will, and, have, and be exposed to this wonderful industry of intercollegiate athletics. And we have done the same thing here at Auburn, where we have a young uh, black woman who is learning the ropes and she gets to see behind the curtain and see what it's like to be an AD. And she says she still wants to, uh, despite my uh, encouraging her to take another path. It's, it's, providing, it's providing opportunities for people, but it's also once they have these opportunities to then make sure that you help develop them so that they don't, there's a term I'm looking for, there's a point in time when someone keeps on climbing in their career, even though they may be deficient in certain areas, but they keep on climbing because they fit a profile, if you will. And at a certain point in time, you can't hide some of the uh, uh, some of your gaps. And sometimes you end up getting fired because of that, because you were done a disservice when you're coming up to the industry and no one pulled you aside and said, all right, hey, Alan, you're doing this. Trust me, that's not going to work. Here's what I want you to do. If you want to be successful, here are some things that you need to keep in mind. So we have to we have to get people in the industry, and then we have to help groom them and grow them so that when they do get to a position of leadership, they've got the skill set necessary to be successful. That's true. I was going to open up, and Greg, I know you were going to do this, but I can see the questions in the chat too, so I wanted to get some of them answered. Um, Alexandra Griffin, she's kind of written in a few times from Fordham University, but her question was, what are some things that you have done to offer transpar transparency to our student athletes in addressing complaints of racially charged incidents between coaches, staff, administration, and student athletes? And I think this is an interesting question because we have so many policies regarding sexual assault and or abuse, and we, we, are, we can easily talk about that in that climate. I think we have a harder time nailing down a racially charged incident or there's more sensitivity to it, I feel like in general. So have you guys thought about ways in which you can make sure that that reporting goes as swiftly and as smoothly as we have in place for um, sexual misconduct? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, 
So we had a situation where some of our former black gymnasts um, made some statements publicly about their experience at Auburn. Mm -hmm. And our coach, Jeff Graba, did an outstanding job, in my opinion, of addressing it head on. In fact, the conversation he had with the former athletes happened prior to them releasing something on social media. But nonetheless, what it did was it made me ask, what do we, I mean, what do we do? Because it's been a topic that we haven't discussed. We haven't, we just haven't discussed it, right? It's not been an issue. It has risen to the level where we needed to address it like sexual assault. So I asked our university in cabinet, I said, there's gonna be other situations that come up like this. And I'm willing to bet there are students on this campus who are going to say similar things. So what do we do? And um, the feedback that we got was essentially take it through the Title IX office, which uh, has EEO as a part of it, and report, uh, Bubba Cunningham, I'll never forget this. He said, report up and report out. And our responsibility is to report up and report out. And then let the professionals guide you on how to navigate it. But in between time, you still have to educate, which is part of what we're doing now and, and why I'm so thankful to be on that cool call right now. I, I agree with Alan. I don't really have a lot to add. I mean, I think you have to, um, you know, you have to hire, you have to talk about expectations, you have to talk about treatment of people uh, and student athletes um, with your uh, coaches uh, in particular and, and what you uh, will and, and will not you know, allow and tolerate and those expectations have to be clear. Um, and I think my coaches understand that. And I think they also understand that the reaction uh, to uh, any accusations like that are going to be investigated and going to be uh, discussed uh, immediately. Uh, and so I want our student athletes to share. It doesn't mean they're guilty because somebody says they're guilty. Uh, people have a right to defend themselves and to talk through things. Um, but I think, you know, some of the egregiousness of, of some of the comments that we've heard uh, that people are saying, you know, is ridiculous and no place for it uh, in a weight room, on a, on a field of play, uh, on a court, on a, in any of our facilities, some of the stuff that has been, a, people have been accused of, um, it's just no no place in our where we should should have people have to tolerate that type of behavior. Um, you know, from a, a racial standpoint, a gender standpoint, um, a, any standpoint uh, is just you know we, we need to be better than that as a, a society. We're teaching young people how to how to how to live life, and that's that's the lesson we're teaching them. You know, to, to call people names and and. And talk about people, and, and that's supposed to be encouraging, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it just uh, along along those lines of what Alan said. So. I wanted to chime in to say that uh, make efforts to create different types of spaces for student athletes to have the opportunity to talk. Um, it's not SAC. Uh, create affinity groups that makes a significant difference also uh, we have something at wyoming called many stories matter and that's uh, a non-judgmental safe space where a student athlete selects any topic they want and they just start talking about it and um there are no judgments about it so last time we talked about kobe bryant um we had our social justice meeting where it was a very diverse group of student athletes in there and just talking about what was it like to be a white guy um in this social justice movement that we're in and they they share so i say that if you create more of those type of safe spaces um discussions could come on whether someone is misappropriating the culture or the, the a derogatory term is being used by a teammate or a coach, things will start coming out organically. And I forgot to mention also another champion, Jim Phillips, Northwestern University. He's mm -hmm. good at hiring people of color. So mm -hmm. good, good for you, Jim. <laughs> Maria, Maria. Yeah. Um, and I know we are student athlete focused, which is uh, the biggest part of our jobs, but we also have staffs. And so for those out there on the call, uh, I would encourage you to take initiative and set up your own 
um, inclusive groups of people so that you can have these types of conversations amongst yourselves. Don't wait for the AD to do it. Don't wait for the SWA to do it. Like take tickets yes. uh, for yourselves. Um, this question is pretty good. Maybe we can shine some light. How can ADs support African-American administrators and coaches during this time? So in my mind, I'm thinking of, you're talking about a white AD that wants to help, like trying to figure out how to be an ally during this time and space. I think the same I, thing. Me, Go ahead, Chad. So is the question, how, how does a white athletic administrator support people? Of That's how I'm receiving it. Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I... I and sorry for the interruption, Ward. I tell you what, no my athletic director Tom Herman is awesome. He's awesome. He, I mean, he's probably one of the, the best ADs out there. When I'm feeling uneasy about something, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be about this particular issue, whatever issue. Uh, fortunately, he is only five steps outside my door. So I can go into his office and have some honest, very honest conversations. Uh, with him uh, and without me feeling that there's um, going to be some backlash to it. So whether it's something he said or a coworker said or just what's happening in the world, we have those kind of conversations. And then we also talk about any types of strategies within the athletics office that we can put together to create a culture of not only compliance, but just um, a culture of support all around. So uh, I, I think that at times that we could have our own podcast <laughs> and, and it, it would be pretty fun to see what it's like for a Wyoming guy and a, a black woman from Chicago to, to talk about things in a very safe environment. So if administrators have not had the opportunity to check on um, their staff in its entirety, not just people of color. But there's staff, and I'm talking about individual checks, not this blanket email saying, hey, how's everyone doing? But to, to, to go door to door and visit and have conversations with them just to do that mental check-in and also to talk about uh, your thoughts as an athletic director, and I'm sure Ward and Allen has done that, have done many check-ins, but that makes a significant difference. I know each each department has such a large staff and it's a lot of ground to cover, but just popping your head in for 10, 15 minutes and uh, having just general conversations, which potentially may lead to bigger ones, that really does make a significant difference for your staff. And then allowing people to just share without fear, without fear, that is so crucial. This is an interesting comment because um, we're kind of built on donors and money obviously makes a difference. Um, Desiree Wilson, as a white fundraiser who solicits gifts from mostly white donors, how can we make an impact or break that barrier of fear of losing a donor's gift by having a conversation we believe in but are afraid that the donor doesn't agree with in regards to social justice? We're all gonna have to approach this conversation I feel like at some point in time. <laughs> Uh, I, I would say if, you, if you're not sure where the, your donor feels, then you should probably ask the question. And that'll, that'll help determine what that path is. Um, and that's a very good question. It's a very complicated situation, mm -hmm. I feel like, um, because you are, you're, you're, you've got these, comp you may have competing interests. Let's just say for sake of argument that you've got a donor who, um, who feels differently, right? Who feels like this, is, this isn't a big deal and uh, they're tired of seeing athletes or black athletes taking a position. Um, they're saying it's being politicized. Listen, right? So par part of what we're, what we're talking about here is understand where someone's coming from. And this ain't about whether you agree or disagree, but just say, huh, why do you say that? Help me understand why you feel that way. Okay, that's interesting to no. know. And then after that, whether it's that same conversation or a separate conversation, go back and say, you know what? I really thought about what you said. I understand where you're coming from. Let me share something else with you. 
have you thought about this, right? I wrote down, and this kind of goes, um, this isn't about politics. And so many, I feel like there's lots of people in our country who are saying, you know, whether professional or student athletes, hey, just stick to sport. Don't get involved in politics. Since when is basic human rights political? There is policy in terms of action, but this is not a political issue. I'm not quite sure how this is a political issue. It does get politicized, unfortunately. The last thing I'll say, and this is somewhat relevant, but I, I wanna share this with you. I had a conversation with someone else and or maybe I'd heard someone say this, I can't remember. <laughs> to the, I'm paraphrasing, to the country, you're lucky, and this is a black person saying this, you're lucky all that black America is asking for is equality, is basic yes. human rights. Equality. Give me the equal opportunity to be successful and navigate and live and manage through this country like my white, my white counterparts. So white America, you're lucky we're not asking for revenge. And when I heard it put that way, I was like, mm, that's deep. Mm. Yes. Basically, yes. That's, that's, what, that, 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 that's all that we're asking for. <laughs> that's exactly. Awesome. You got it, Maria. That's how it yeah. is. Be and that's the last comment because we're literally running out of time, but that is that is so incredibly true that at the end of the day, that is what all of these conversations are about. You guys are all amazing. I've loved the conversation. Alan, China, Ward, I, I still, I look up to you to this day. And like I said, the work that you guys are doing are going to affect generations to come. You're leaders in our industry. We're going to continue to look to you during this moment, but also moving forward. Um, and I hope that you guys remain encouraged during that time. And I hope everyone that was listening heard something that sticks with them or something they can take back to their athletic association. Um, and Greg, again, thank you so much for having us. And I know that you'll have the final word. I don't, incredibly powerful from everybody. And uh, I, I thank each of you for, for the leadership that, that each of you are showing in your departments nationally, Maria, for what, with what you do. And uh, we all benefit from listening and learning. And then, but taking action is what we heard. And, and each, of, each of our departments have opportunities to grow there. So these conversations need to continue, but they need to be sprung into action for the next steps. So guys, y'all are rock stars, every single one of you. And, and appreciate you very much. Um, there's going to be other programming uh, through NACTA, so please keep an eye out for that. But, uh, um, you know, just thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, and uh, we and I, I'm saying it starts with me right here. Um, we have to continue to grow and we have to continue to learn. And we have to support our student athletes. We have to support our coaches and staff and have our department represent what our what our student athlete makeup represents too and that's a critical important moving forward part moving forward so thank you all again appreciate you and uh we'll look forward to seeing y'all in person soon i hope um but mm -hmm. uh you're y'all you, are great so thank you thank you maria thank you greg thanks thank you, guys everybody. thanks everyone join mawa <laughs> and NACTA. And NACTA, there we go. And watch ESPN. Oh, for everyone. Oh, for everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.